Hey, Michael. Hey, hey. Hello, everybody in the chat or we're watching it later. Thanks for showing up. So um, shall we just kick it off? Let's do it. Hello and welcome to Python Bytes, where we deliver Python news and headlines directly to your earbuds. This is episode 317, recorded January 3rd, 2023, and I am Brian Aachen. Hello, I'm Michael Kennedy. Welcome to 2023. How exciting. It is very exciting. It's a lot like 2022, but I think maybe a little more optimism. We'll see. Yeah, but I've had one extra shower in 2020 since 2022. So, yeah. I mean, I... Do you, do you remember 2022? It just feels like a few days ago. It's it incredible. honestly, it really flew by. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we stayed inside for like two years and they're like, hey, well, look, we get to go outside. Oh, time flies when you're not just stuck yeah. inside. I even actually rode a bicycle the other day. Um, oh, nice. And then Oregon said we're going to rain for two weeks. So, of course, of course it did. Yeah. Um, well, let's kick it off. What do you got for us first? All right. Let's talk about the Stack Overflow 2022 Developer Survey. Now, this is one of the better surveys that gives you a, a pulse on the developer community. It's, you know, we do the PSF survey every year, and that one I think is really well done. This one's interesting because it's not just Python, obviously. It's all of Stack Overflow people. Yeah. And it's really, really long. Notice the scroll bar. So I'm going to try to um, go through these uh, and just hit on some of the, the high points for us. All right. So they did that as well for us at the top here. They kind of summarized some little things you can call out and then jump to other sections saying uh, learning to code online increased by 10% year over year. However, Respondents older than 45 years are most likely to have learned from books, whereas the youngins the, are more likely to use some kind of online um, course or you know YouTube video or something along those lines. Yeah? Does that surprise you? No. Yeah, me either. <laughs> so last year they said we saw Git rise as a fundamental tool of software development. So like if you are a software developer, you basically just need to know Git. Surprisingly, this year they said that's Docker this year, increasing from 55% usage to 69% usage. Hmm. And I kind of feel like the, the hype and the heyday of Docker was actually a couple of years ago. And it, I hear a little bit less, maybe it's just less hype, but it's just more like, yeah, we're just using it, but... I don't know that that was surprising and interesting to me. I'm using it more in places where I didn't used to. Um, so like what? Uh, build chains for just to, to keep them consistent. We're just, uh, it does, and it isn't even a cloud thing. It's just um, uh, having, being able to have a consistent build system uh, no matter what machine you're on. Um, yeah, that makes so a lot C of sense. CI systems are utilizing uh, uh, Docker more. Sure. I've heard of even people using Docker to sort of manage and deploy. Is that is that how you would phrase it? Uh, little apps to Raspberry Pis for like home automation and stuff. Really? And I'm, sure there, <laughs> I'm sure there would be more of that if you could actually get a Raspberry Pi. But you know, this is more of a theoretical. Those who already have the Raspberry Pi. Uh, the most one of my favorite sections of this is the most loved, most dreaded, and most wanted. <laughs> Yeah, because it really tells you, you know, like how do people feel about how things are now and how do they feel about where they're going? Right. What what would they do if they were unencumbered by, you know, their boss saying, nope, we're using this particular database or, or nope, it's all angular and you're on the team that does angular. So I don't care what you want. You're doing angular, you know. And so Rust is on its seventh year as the most loved language. Okay. Seven years? Is it even Apparently. seven years old? <laughs> I know. I know. That's my thought as well. But okay. 87% of developers saying they want to continue using it. Wow. I mean, huh. yeah, anyway, that's pretty interesting. Uh, but it also, Python and Rust are ex basically exactly tied as the most wanted programming language. That's cool. I can see that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Phoenix, Phoenix is some 
some web framework I've never heard of that is apparently the most popular. Angular JS it continues into its third year of being the most dreaded. <laughs> All right, what else? <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, just React. Um, uh, yeah, is most wanted, but who knows? Yeah, exactly. So some of these questions and some of these phrasings and analyses are super, super good, and others are really bad. So I'll, I'll try to highlight some of these. So let me jump down here. Well, I don't really care about the education stuff. Um, I mean, <laughs> it tells you <laughs> education profile. It tells you things like, yeah, there's an insane number of guys versus women. In, no, that's fine. I just thought it was in. funny that you said I don't care about education. <laughs> no, I, I don't. <laughs> and teacher, you know, leave the kids alone. All right. So no, it's, like it's it's fine, but it's you know people can check it out if they care about it, right? Like there's yeah. there's stuff about the demographics, like age and and gender that is pretty interesting. I wish some of these numbers were better. Like yeah, we this, do make that's some efforts to improve. Yeah, it totally is right, but. You know, that's yeah. also not news. So, um, yeah, some of the most popular technologies here. Now, I don't know, Brian, I might just be getting older and grumpy. But when I look at this, there's like it's almost all these responses are broken into two segments, professional developers and learning the code people. Um, and the default is to take all those together. And I guess that's the biggest picture. But I don't know. I just when I ever look at this, I'm just like professional developers. Tell me about this. Like, yeah, you know, if, if some t if you're on your third week of a coding tutorial and that tutorial says use this, like how how much does that really speak to the state of the community? I don't think it, you know, agreed. I, 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 so I'm checking like when I think about these, I'm just going to check professional developer. And if you want the same numbers and do so as well. So where are we? We are on programming languages, scripting and markup. JavaScript is definitely the most popular here. This is one of those areas where I don't, I think you need to phrase it a little bit different. Let's see what the question exactly is. Which programming languages have you done extensive development work in over the year, over the last year, okay? I. I don't know how quite how to solve this problem, but there's a ton of Python people who did JavaScript work. Yeah. There is a, a ton of C++ people who did SQL, right? There's also Python people who did SQL. So SQL ranks above Python, but there's very few people whose job it is as a developer to write SQL and not <laughs> use something else, right? So yeah. that's... Um, it's weird to have uh, SQL even in there. Yeah, I know. But, well, HTML and, and CSS, right, is, is like a little bit weirder yeah. as well. And so I feel like it should say like, what is your primary programming language or, or something like, you know, something like that, right? I feel like it's... It's it's kind of like favorite movie. Like, what's your favorite mm -hmm. movie, but not Princess Bride? Other than that, what's your favorite <laughs> movie? Yes, yeah. exactly. Exactly. So like, there's people who do Node.js and JavaScript, and that is what I think this top bar where JavaScript is should represent, yeah. but it's that plus everyone else, right? Aggregated. Um, so I don't know. It's these are a little bit weird, but I'll, I'll just go yeah, back in. So like, unless you're uh, primarily just a front end developer, what back end languages or right, right, or maybe you're using Node on the back end. But then yeah. uh, other than that, so um, JavaScript number one, HTML top programming language. Okay, uh, SQL third most, and then Python, and then TypeScript. So you know, like a bunch of interesting ones, and then you've got your your um your uh, VM um, garbage collected JavaScript uh, Java and C sharp back there, and then it starts to fall fall off pretty quick after that. Down at the very bottom, let's see the very bottom one is Crystal. Okay, and APL. Oh my gosh, APL, APL is is uh, something. All right, uh, another one that's worth uh, talking about is databases. So yeah. we've got Postgres. MySQL, SQLite, SQL Server, and MongoDB as the top five. So um, it's pretty clear that Postgres has the momentum. Like MySQL was higher, and now Postgres is passing it. But you know that's kind of a going up uh, here. So this is which environments have you done extensive work in? We'll also see that in like the loved versus dreaded section. Yeah. <laughs> 
And by the way, on the audience, Marco says, uh, I've already aged myself with that Pink Floyd reference. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed I have. All right. So cloud platforms, you know, AWS, I want to surprise you that AWS has over half of the entire market. No. No. But no. only it's only a smidge over half. It's 55. So. Yeah, exactly. Uh, web technologies, huge another one. Um, no, not this. This one's kind of kind of okay, but like for example, they've got Node.js, um, but they don't have Python, right? So I don't know. It's it's a little bit funky. Like they have Node and Express, and Express runs on Node, whereas they have Flask and Django, but they don't have the thing that Django and Flask run on, which is I don't know. Anyway, it's it's a little bit of a, a challenging one, but Node and React are, are quite high up there. Look at this uh, art artifact, this uh, living living fossil right here, Brian. What's number three? jQuery. jQuery, you know it. <laughs> Dollar document ready. Let's go. All right. <laughs> I learned jQuery a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I still use a little bit of jQuery if there's some site that's already using it. I'm like, yeah, whatever. It's gonna. I'm just going to put one handler in here and not worry about it. Fast API is um, on the list. Yeah, Fast API is on the list. Um, Django and Flask are 14.6%, both. Fast API is 6% and going up. Um, Fast API is just actually had a Ruby on Rails, which is pretty interesting. Wait, so Phoenix is down at 2%, 2.13%, but I thought it was like... <laughs> it's the most loved. Okay. It's the most wanted. I'm not... Okay. I looked at it. I'm not sure I agree with that, but it's um, it's a, a web framework built on a, the Elixir language. So okay. there you have it. And yeah, we'll see. Um, so, yeah, uh, another one here that's worth pointing out. I'm not going to go over too many more. Um, other frameworks and libraries. This one is, is pretty pretty weird in terms of like the partition. This is what I had in mind when I'm like, there's something really weird about this. <laughs> So yeah, .NET and NumPy in the same bucket. Exactly. So .NET is the equivalent of Python. It's the equivalent of C++. <laughs> it's the equivalent of Ruby, right? It's like a huge and broad. And it's the thing that all the other stuff in that ecosystem runs on, right? ASP.NET yeah. or whatever. And so they say, what other language do you work with? Do you work or other uh, libraries? Do you work with .NET or do you work with NumPy? <laughs> Or do you work with Panda? There's no Python here, right? And there's no Go and there's no, no, uh, I don't know. Like, it's just, it's, I feel like this just fully is like out of place here. So if you just go past that, the, the top two are NumPy and Pandas, which by quite a good margin. And then Spring for Java, React Native uh, for mobile with JavaScript, Flutter, uh, and, but then back to a bunch of Python uh uh, yeah, libraries like so, learn PyTorch. Yeah, so Python actually ranks pretty high in the other frameworks and libraries you might be using. All right, let's just let's jump to the loved, dreaded, um, wanted section, and then uh, that's probably enough. People can check out the rest. All right, so they've got this sort of, you know, like what is driving the market? Greed versus <laughs> fear type of thing. And so they put every, each technology up and it's got a how much love versus how much hate does this technology get in a single bar, which is the, the, the graphics here are pretty nice. Um, so Rust, 86% love. So people who use Rust really like Rust and yeah. they don't strongly dislike it. It's probably a self-selecting group, right? If you made... If you took, I don't know, JavaScript people and told them they had to do Rust, they might not like it. But Rust people seem to really like Rust. Uh, Elixir, I've never done anything with Elixir, but it's uh, it's also really high. Closure, TypeScript, and Python is there at about two-thirds loved, one-third uh, dreaded, I suppose, or not loved. And you can see it goes down from there. Yeah, I kind of want to talk to those 32% of the people and say, what is it that you don't like? Well, I agree. I feel like there's a lot of people who end up... So, for example, if you look at just the third that says they don't like it, that's 11 times as many people using Elixir. And that's two times yeah. all the people using Rust. So, so I think it's a little bit, you know, a scale thing, right? Like, Yeah. 
there's a bunch of people who were working in one technology and then they were told you're going to do Python. And some of them wanted that change. And some of them probably like, but I like C++ or I like whatever I'm doing. And, you know, they're unhappy to be in that situation. So I imagine there's some of that going on here. Yeah. Whereas there's less people like being moved into Elixir projects unless they really, you know, want to, because there's it's a pretty small group. <laughs> anyway, there's that. And then if you switch to the wanted though, Python and Rust tie for number one in uh, most wanted. Along with TypeScript is showing very notable there. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Uh, last one, we'll say uh, databases, I suppose. Postgres, most loved, least dreaded. Uh, Redis, again, one of the things like, does this really belong on this list? Redis is cool. It's mostly for caching and message queues, not really as a standalone independent database. So can it really be the most wanted database? Uh, you technically, I know, can make it work that way, but it's not really built for it. So I don't know. Anyway, Redis is number two, whether it belongs there or not. And then MongoDB and SQLite and, and so on. In terms of wanted, Postgres and Mongo. Nice. No, not too much of a change. All right. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. I'll give just a quick shout out to some graphics that are down here that people can play with. If you really want to go explore, Brian, check this out. Like, uh, which one is this? Uh, this uh, database one's probably fair. So ch there's this giant, it's, I don't know what section is this. It is work with versus want to work with. <laughs> okay. So okay. Um, it has this Ooh, wheel. Pretty. And as you move around the wheel, it'll show you, for example, 5,000 people who worked with Postgres want to work with SQLite. Uh, oh. 8,000 people who work with MongoDB want to stay with it. Whereas 7,000 people who work with MySQL want to move to MongoDB. And similarly, there's like, it shows you all these interesting trends and flows from this technology to that technology. Like if you go up here to the language one and you go to pros and you click on C sharp, it's pretty interesting because like the C sharp people, they want to go to TypeScript or Python or JavaScript or HTML, but they don't want to go to java like there's no arc over to java right because these are basically the same technology with slight different trade-offs so if you wanted to be in java you would just be in java i feel like uh which yeah you can sort of check out these these flows and stuff so anyway i think that's more than enough on this survey but people should go check it out there's a lot of data here and a lot of um a lot of things to learn so does that say hype script I, I script it doesn't fit on the screen that's all oh, okay. it's, it's hype script <laughs> hype yeah there's just ype script typescript okay. with, with yeah it's just a scaling nice yeah okay so uh, before we move on real quick john out in the audience says it's interesting that mysql and maria db are perceived so differently yeah and that is true yeah i don't know much i i think that mysql like has a problem that People used it a long time ago, and maybe it's mm -hmm. different now. But I mean, that's what I'm basing it. My ba my experience with my sequels like all ten, over ten years ago. So yeah, same. All right, what you got for us next? <laughs> well, I um I wanted to talk about Peppy or P. I don't know. It's P E P Y dot tech. So uh, I found out about this. Um, who did I find from from the uh, the person that wrote it? Petru Rares. Um, so it's it's we've talked about something similar what we, we've talked about before is um is pypi download stats or pypi stats.org and so i was like well what's different so uh, peppy does download stats for um for packages so what i'm showing we're showing here is uh the the stats for pytest um and what the pypi stats does is it shows you a breakdown of like you've got the overall packages but then you can also look at um, downloads per Python 2 versus 3, and then uh, major and minor versions of Python. And so that's kind of interesting. Okay. But, um, but, it, but I actually now, after we're like so much far past the 2 through versus 3 split, like I'm not even supporting 2 anymore. Um, so uh, what I like is, Peppy doesn't do that. So Peppy's uh, same stats are same for PyTest. What it's looking at is it grabs like the top handful. So let's do the default. Uh, I have it all customized right now. Uh, so let's uh, drop them, drop those off. Uh, by default, it shows us um, 
the the last few versions of PyTest plus all of the all of the downloads for the last major one. So all the seven X downloads, and um, so the the numbers are a little different because we're not showing everything. So uh, right off the bat, I kind of like that I'm just caring about the last few versions. That's kind of nice, and it also has a daily, weekly, monthly chart so that you can kind of uh, see trends going on, mm -hmm. um, which is nice. Um, the, uh, what I didn't realize at first is, uh, that you can, you can select, uh, different down, different statistics. So if I wanted to see everything on all versions, I can just go ahead and type a star there. Um, I think that works. Yeah. There you go. And then does, does all of the downloads. And then also when I just dropped that, I don't know if you noticed, but it shows all the, all the different download stats already. So you can kind of get a glimpse of what you're going to find. Um, right off the bat. Now going th down through the chart, we've got both a chart and a table for for when they when they grab the data. Um, and this this split up of I'm not looking at Python version. I'm looking at version for the package that I care about, um, or like you know possibly my package. So I did this recently for PyTest check, um, and I was thinking about it for PyTest of like which version should I support. And clearly, like most, like tons of people have switched up to, most people have switched to 7X already. So, uh, yeah, I think it's perfectly fair game to not support 6X PyTest anymore. So, why not? Um, anyway, so just a different different take on uh, download stats. Plus, it includes some cool badges that if you want to grab your, uh, like, add this to your, to your repo to say how many downloads per week or per month. Um, kind of neat so yeah that's really cool um if you you know if you're open if you're maintaining some open source package and you're like should i and it depends on something like this like pytest you just you can quickly look at that and, and make a call like well how how important is it for me to support this old version or how ready am i to move to the to the new thing adopt this feature that won't allow older versions of you know python or whatever it is you're looking at right like should we add types well that might not work on like where is that three three and before well it's yeah fine. well like on pytest check I've, the, I've got a feature that i'm going to deprecate and it's only been in since like the last version i just didn't think through the api enough i think um yeah. but so i wanted to take a look how many people are using the most recent version and Actually, so most of the people are, or quite a few people are using the most recent version, but it isn't most. It's a, if I do like a total of every, every version, um, it's definitely not most people using the most recent one, but yeah, don't know. And of those, I have no idea what, if they're using the feature or not, but anyway, it, it, interesting, take a look on it and I appreciate it. And it's open source project as well. Um, and uh, some of these graphs have been, uh, uh, updated by a contributor so it's kind of kind of nice to have it alive and well on open source so. peppy peppy.tech yeah very nice good find i like it all right off to our sponsor for the week yes um thank you microsoft my for sponsoring this episode this episode is brought to you by microsoft for startups founders hub starting a business is hard but by some estimates, over 90% of startups will go out of business in the first year. Ouch. With this in mind, Microsoft for Startups set out to understand what startups need to be successful and create a digital platform to help overcome those challenges. And Startups Founders Hub was born. Microsoft for Startups Founders Hub provides all founders at any stage with free resources to help solve startup challenges. The platform provides technology benefits access to expert guidance and skilling resources, mentorship and network connections, and much more. Unlike others in the industry, Microsoft for Startups Founders Hub does not require startups to be investor-backed or third-party validated to participate. It is truly open to all. So what do you get? You can speed up development with free access to GitHub and the Microsoft Cloud with the ability to unlock credits over time to help with your startup and to help innovate, Founders Hub is partnering with innovative companies like OpenAI, a global leader in AR research and development, to provide exclusive benefits and discounts. 
through Founders Hub, becoming a founder is no longer about who you know. You'll have access to men their mentorship network, giving you access to a pool of hundreds of mentors across a range of disciplines, across areas like idea validation, fundraising, management, and coaching, sales and marketing, as well as specific technical stress points. You'll be able to book a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the mentors, many of whom are former, founder, fa former founders themselves. Make your ideas a reality today with the critical support you'll get from Microsoft for Startups Founders Hub. To join the program, visit pythonbytes.fm slash foundershub2022 or click the link in your show notes. Indeed. Thank you, Microsoft for Startups. Let's move over here. So this next one uh, comes to us from several folks recommending it. And to be honest, I'm not sure if I would cover it if there wasn't a bunch of people saying, hey, you should cover it. This is really interesting. So <laughs> I'll, I'll sort of take their lead and say, this does look pretty interesting. So Jeff Hutchins and Abdulaziz Alsqasim sent this in. Thank you both for sending it. And this is the Codon Python compiler. Have you heard about this, Brian? Uh, just from uh, people submitting it. So. Yeah, and people talk about Python performance all the time. Sometimes, I would say most of the time, it doesn't really matter to you. Most of the time, you're spending way more time waiting on a network, waiting on an API call, waiting on a database. But sometimes, it really does matter, and you need your code to go faster, right? So, you know, traditional options have included things like uh, Numba or... Um, Cython or even PyPy, PYPY for the JIT compiled version of Python. So here's one more thing to put into that category of options called Codon from Exaloop. And it's a high performance, zero overhead, extensible Python compiler using LLVM. And LLVM is, you know, the compilers that gets used all the time, of course, uh, for, for a bunch of different things. And they claim that it is on the order of 10 to 100 times or more faster than regular Python for single core performance. And because it really compiles to some native code, they say also, by the way, sometimes better than C++ in terms of performance. But it also, because it compiles to some native representation, it doesn't involve the gill so you also get better scaling and it comes out of this uh i think genetics project called sec hmm. bioinformatics rather which is this uh, a language for bioinformatics and i think what they've decided is like you know let's just go and just do straight python <laughs> right and if you go to exaloop.io they've got um a couple of sort of selling points here is, you know, performance of C, ease of, ease of Python. It adopts Python syntax and is fully interoperable with Python. And they've got this little flow graphic type thing, which shows your Python code. And if you look, it's not even type annotated, which kind of surprised me, Brian. I, I figured they would at least require you add, you know, Python type ins. Yeah. But no, it says you take Python syntax and semantics and you feed it in. It builds up an abstract syntax tree. It does some kind of um, type inference to figure out what the types are like ints. Comes up with an intermediate representation and then applies a bunch of JIT style optimizations and domain specific optimizations and outcomes. It's pretty interesting. Native code, as I said, but also, where does this show? I guess it doesn't have a better picture because it's cut off here. Outcomes, native code, but also WebAssembly and GPU targeted code so think That's about cool. that you, you want to write some code say this python code does matrix stuff i want it to run on my nvidia gpu you know dash dash gpu or whatever the thing you do to make it come out with that is that's pretty pretty wild All, or put it on the web with web assembly uh, it sounds great it does sound great so uh they've got some examples it says we're going to have a list uh, fruits, just three strings, banana, apple, and lime, and some prices in a dictionary. Banana has a price, apple has a price. And it says we're going to write standard for fruit in fruits. F string print out the price of the fruit. And then it's going to put a bunch of stuff in the cart by doing less multiplication and addition like you would expect. 
call the sum with a comprehension and print it out. And then boom, no problem. Compile that to native code if you want. Okay. It says if you know Python, there's nothing to learn. Um, yeah, so it's a I, bunch of yeah, go ahead. question is which Python? It says Python syntax, but which Python syntax? Is it 310, 39, 311? Yeah, it's not clear other than 3.6 or above because of the F strings. The only okay. only giveaway I see here. Um, and possibly lots of people are fine with not exactly knowing which version of the syntax. Yeah, I didn't say. I mean, maybe if you go into the docs, it'll exactly say right, but not in the little landing page. Uh, it was initially dissolved to solve computing challenges in genomics, uh, which is so focused on. Also, it's got a bunch of stuff focused on finance and um, GPUs for CUDA programming, as well as WebAssembly, which is pretty dope. Yeah. Also, if you scroll down a little bit, there's a little video. Let me I'll hit, tell it to go. There's a video. I'll tell it to stop. I don't know. Where they show it running as a kernel in Jupyter Notebooks. Oh, and wow. Just doing standard standard Python stuff with like kind of mass intensive things and then pulling in matplotlib and you know showing the various things you get with matplotlib. Um, so yeah, it looks pretty good. So uh, what do you think? Uh, I think even if it, I, I'd like to know what version of Python it's compatible with, but other than that, it looks fun. Um, and it looks really good. It's on GitHub. And so it is technically at least source open. What is the license here? The license is a business source license. What the heck is a business source license? Hmm. Okay. From the MariaDB Corp. Um, Yeah, I'm gonna have to figure out what the business source license. <laughs> I don't know that one. But you it's can not read like, the source, but it's yeah, ours. I don't that's know. That's why I said, is it source open or is it is it not? Yeah. And so all this stuff is good. And the reason I'm hesitant to recommend it, but I, I think these benefits are really big and you know, people can use it then great. You go a little further, it says Exaloop and you. This is free for non-production use. If you want to use it for things that are commercial, then do you know what it costs? Don't know. Contact I us. Don't, I don't know either. If you yeah. gotta ask, it's too much, it's too much for you. So <laughs> let's just let's just put it there. That's what my um, dad always said. If you gotta ask, you can't afford it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Which I don't know. I don't I'm not against them charging for it. I understand that this is probably an insane amount of work to put yeah. together and if that's their model that's that's their program it's fine i don't think everything has to be given away free there's tons of work that goes into a lot of stuff and sometimes charging for it is the right answer but just tell people what it costs you know don't make them email you that is it's really not good it's well really so terrible. so robert mentions uh robert robinson maybe it's a sliding scale and it's like it depends on who's asking um you know uh, Microsoft calls up and asks. It's a different price than. Uh, yeah, I'm sure know. it is a different price, and I'm sure that's. Oh. oh, do you want to run it all on all of Azure? Well, here's the price. But you know, put put some common cases in there. And are you a data scientist and you want to use it for an API? Here's what it costs. Are you trying to host <laughs> it as a server? Well, here, like then maybe you need to like there should be at least a little bit of a here's the realm of where you start right yeah. a lot of things have you know here's the base price here's the pro price here's the enterprise price and here's the contact us if you, that doesn't fit you right but to yeah. say it, it costs money we won't tell you what it costs i don't know it just sounds well and in not the, great. and i hope people so that the free non-production non-commercial versus commercial that's still a fuzzy line, and I wish I wish there was like more detail on whenever anybody does that because yeah. I've been in in situations a lot where I'm just some dude writing a script in a company, and the company's big, but I just want to get this thing to work, and it's just a small piece of my build chain or something. I'm not going to get okay to to do a corporate license for something mm -hmm. for, just to save me five minutes a day. Um, yeah, and maybe so, you're not selling it, right? Yeah, it's for example. Not, um, yeah, oh, that's another thing. Is if is it part of the thing I'm selling, or is it just part of my work to get something else done? Um, so. 
Yep. Yeah. Indeed. So anyway, pluses and minuses, but it's uh, an interesting contribution. And thanks, folks, for sending that in. Definitely. Indeed. Well, so I want to talk about type hints a little bit. I've been thinking about type hints a lot and ran across this uh, article called Eight Levels of Using Type Hints in Python. And um, it's from uh, Yang Cho. And I, first off, I love the graphic. The, this is an unsplash graphic, but uh, I'm kind of a fan of uh, it. It looks like a, like a posters, like a, a movie or like band posters or something like that on on a something, and half of them are peeled off. Um, so I don't know. C- cool image. Anyway, yeah. Complete yeah. side note. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I I was attracted to this because this eight eight state. I thought. I kind of thought of it as like eight stages of using type hints because that's kind of how I started using type hints and it almost got the order the same. So let's go through, through these orders. So the first one is, did, did I skip over it? Um, the first was uh, type hints for basic data types. So basically, um, and like you kind of do this if you're using data classes at all. Um, you just say, well, I've got, I've got it, my age is an int and it defaults to 29 um, just to kind of tell people what what a, you're thinking about and while you're you know uh, my uh, my posts are a tuple uh, and they default to an empty empty tuple or something um so this is um this is pretty much how i started as well and i started mostly because i was started using type uh, data classes and this is what they look like when you're def- declaring the com- contents of a data class um the and then so where do you go from there? The next uh, the next stage is uh, defining a constant using final type. Actually, I've never used this. Um, have you ever used final? I've wanted to use it, but it's so it's so not exactly enforced type of thing. It's like right. I would, Python I doesn't love, enforce it, but I would love to have a constant in Python. But doing it through typing means the only time it's going to be validated or checked is if I run my pi or something. And like most of the time, I'm not, you know? So it's like, well, okay, whatever. I'm not doing that. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually increasing the amount of times I'm using uh, my pi or other, or other type checking things. But um, yeah, I, I wouldn't have put this number two, but minor gripe. It's kind of a cool feature. So it is a cool feature, though. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't knock it, its existence. Yeah. I just wish it was more supported like in the language yeah uh the third is uh adding multiple type hints to one variable um like it shows here uh, a couple different ways the union of an int and a float or the bar of int and float and i my the most the number one way i use this i mean i use things like this also like it could be an int or float but i mostly use it for uh, uh like int or none or something or none because I've got a default value of none. And I kind of wish there was another way to do it. Cause I, when you, when you have a, I don't know, it's kind of convenient anyway, but like, let's say I've got a parameter to a function and it defaults when I internally, I assign it, it defaults to none if nobody passes anything in, but I also don't really want somebody to pass none in, you know? Um, uh, so I wish there was a like the default is none, but users can't pass in none or something like that. Um, yeah, but anyway, it works. Um, and and in the end, it helps with testing anyway to be able to pass in all all the types. But so yeah, the the and I've totally switched to the bar thing. I I think it was three ten that added that. Do you remember? Uh, I think it was three. I think oh, it, it was three ten. Yeah, it says right here. Three ten says there. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So uh, anything I'm writing, I, I support 310 and above because I like the bar. Uh, anyway. um, the next thing is using general type hints, which um, also this is, yeah, I think I think now we're starting to increase the stage of understanding of how, how type hints can help you. And the notion, like in the example, they use uh, iterable um, as, uh, as, you know, from typing import iterable. So you say that, you know, I'm, I'm accepting something like numbers and it takes an iterable um i love this use and i i've you know it, it takes a little bit more of advanced use so you get a little more comfortable with type hints and uh to be able to say i'm gonna do iteration like for in and nums it doesn't really matter what it is if it's a list or a tuple or 
or something else as long as i can iterate over it it's it's good so um uh, the other thing is uh, probably, and I can't, I'm not sure why they didn't put, is, is optional, but along the same t- is iterable. I like, uh, I'm going to often say it's iterable, but the type inside is an int uh, mm-hmm. or something like that. Um, but anyway. Right. The fifth yeah, one is like, bracket int or something. Like, or yeah. Whole bracket strings, you know, what you get out. Yeah. The the fifth is uh, type hints for functions. And I probably would have put this as like number two because I, start using this right away of mm-hmm. um yeah uh to, to say um because it's it, it, that's one of the things that's hard with when i came to python from c plus plus is knowing like where do i put the the return value like the return type is is a uh, you know maybe maybe it's multiple return types which i don't really want it to be but um but it's nice to be able to see what the return type is and type hints add that with the uh, with type hints for functions right. or, or you read a function and you're like, I want to call that, but what do I do? Um, yeah. Do I, to it, right? do I have to read the function and try to understand it? Or can I just read the definition? Right. I, I think this is one of the main uses right here. And it's also nice to be able to see right there. If, uh, if it with a union type is, is not a possibility. Do I have to deal with nothing coming back uh, as something is possible? Uh, number six is alias for type hints. And, I kind of love this. I, I haven't been using this much, but I'm going to start using it more. Um, especially it says with uh, in Python 3.10. So before Python 3.10, you had to do like from typing import type alias and have this weird syntax thing around it. Um, but it's not really that weird. It's uh, But the after 3.10, you just sort of declare a thing. It says like post type. Posts type is a dict that goes from int to string. That's great. And then you can use that as a type hint at other places. So, and that's interesting. That's news to me. Yeah, that's really interesting. So definitely, uh, I'll definitely start using that. So I'm glad I read the article for that. Uh, type hints for class for a class itself, which I don't, I'm not sure why it was titled this, but basically it's the self type. Um, and this is very helpful if you have a class a, a class that has objects that refer to other objects of the same type. You, I don't know how how you did that before then i guess i wasn't caring about it but <laughs> you had I mean, to there was a hack where you put it into quotes so the the example from this article is a class called list node and it's going to be past the previous node right so what is the type of that well it should be a list node yeah python is in the process of building up the list node class so it doesn't yet know what it is but you're trying to define a function that has that so there's this weird catch 22 thing yeah chicken and egg thing so what you put is you would put list node in quotes that's the old version Mm. and of course it was just a string but then it's like well but it's a string that says that so we're gonna just guess that that's what you want you know it it was weird (laughs) okay well the the eighth and final one is the to provide literals for variables and i haven't done this but it's kind of nice also and i didn't know you could do this um just to say and in the example it's um uh, from typing import literal, and then you define like a weekend uh, that's a literal that can only be the strings Saturday or Sunday. And so this isn't an enumeration. It's a, it's just saying that it can only have these particular values. So I think I got that right. I mm-hmm. don't think it has to be an enumeration, but no, um, no. So this this is and the and so like the example says well if you assign that variable to Monday, it's gonna your your type checkers are gonna complain because you didn't assign the one of the known ones, mm-hmm. um, and I probably would use this in conjunction with enums or maybe I don't have to with enums I don't know, um, but but there's a lot of stuff that is passed around that's kind of like an enum but it's passed around as just a handful of strings that it can only be one of these strings so yeah be nice for this to support it henry on the audience points out that x colon final equals true also maps to one of these literal checks so is literal of true rather than just a bool so the type checker can make sure it's always true not true or false so Mm. there's an interesting tie together of those as well and uh, robert points out that it sounds like a case of the mondays (laughs) oh dear um and henry mentions that Last time I checked, self is not supported by MyPy, but so we'll have to check on that. Yeah. Anybody from MyPy listening, 
Okay. Let us know. Let us know. Well, that's it for for this. I just uh, thought it was a good. I and I I do think this is um a, a good idea is to to not try to jump in the deep end of of type hints. Um, uh, ch- try try some of the simple stuff first, and then uh, then get you get to caring about it. So, yeah, that was a good good little discussion around it. That was fun. Yeah. All right. Got any extras for us? You want to throw out there? Uh, the only extra. I- wanted to bring up is uh the test and code hasn't had an episode since like october or something and it's not dead i just kind of wanted to take the holiday off um without telling anybody uh and uh it's coming back so sometime in january there will be a test and code episode so oh, excellent looking forward to it all right i have a few extras and one leads to another which leads to another as is the nature of all these things so i wrote i ran across a couple of articles let me start that way that sort of talked about RSS and how RSS is actually kind of important as a foundation of the independent web in, in ways maybe bigger than like I really realized. So there's this one called Back to RSS. I'll just read you a little excerpt from each of them. It says, it's 2023 or 1999 or whatever. Personal sites are back, blogs are back, RSS is back, and owning your data is becoming real, which is kind of a, a cool uh, thing. And then also there's this one the same day on um, The Verge called Bring Back Personal Blogging. And um, yeah, anyway, so I I ended up writing a welcome back RSS article that kind of riffed on those ideas and talked about some more, talked about reader, which I talked about before and stuff. So yeah, anyway, people uh, can go check out that article and it's interesting. And as part of the conversation, I learned about reader as in reader.readthedocs.io, which is a reader uh, is a Python feed reader library. So it does things like let you subscribe with Python to RSS and Atom and JSON feeds, mark articles as read and important, filter them, get stats, Ooh. do all the like basically if you wanted the 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 logical internals of an RSS reader, here's a Python library to do that, which is cool. Now what we that, need to do is have a listener like take reader and put a textual front end on it. So we have like oh, a, yes, actually that's a pretty interesting idea. That'd be cool. <laughs> uh this is Guy over here built this thing called Kustos, which is uh, basically like Instapaper, uh, a self-hosted Python web app built on Reader. So people can check that out. And then Readwise looks really interesting. Are you familiar with Readwise? No. So it's like an RSS reader, but it also lets you take notes, mark stuff as read for later, even if it doesn't have an RSS feed, and highlight like your Ooh. research as you're going through it and save it. So think how good that would be for people that say, do podcast, you got to remember a bunch <laughs> of stuff about an article, pull that thing back up and it's got your highlights and your notes on it. So oh, I'm liking this. I'm going to have to check it yeah. out. Yeah. That's looking pretty good. So anyway, all that stuff came from uh, this little article that I wrote. People can check that out. Nice. Uh, another, another very important thing. There's this, uh, this Mastodon account called year progress. And it just goes along, and every day, it just posts a, a progress bar for how far we are in the daily progress. <laughs> so it's like a little ASCII, you know, TQDM style progress bar of the year. Hmm. And it's just notable that we just had a 100% progress for the year. <laughs> now that we're now we're done, it's, it's reset to zero, but it was 100%. I- Actually, it looks like it doesn't actually do it every day, but it does it when it goes to a new percentage. So it's every few days or two yeah. or three days, right? So. Yeah, yeah, it looks like it. Which I guess is probably good. I mean, thank you for not doing it. It's like saving three point six, two point six posts, something like that. Yeah. Uh, all right. It, it we- don't just watch it. Wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that exciting. It doesn't update that often. <laughs> It has no decimal point, so it's it's uh, uh, not, yeah. it's got to work in big ASCII blocks, so it does what it does. All right, this is um, something that people might want to keep an eye out who had automated builds running over the winter break, and also use PyTorch. So one of the like thoughts I had was like I was doing I was just kind of kicking back. We we're hanging around. I'm like, you know, I'm going to work on some of these little weird projects like i'd like the the login page on talk python chain to just be a little smoother and cleaner maybe i'll just go play with that like i 
I'm not really going to do real work, but it'd be kind of fun to do some web design and just sort of like no pressure redesign that a little bit. And I thought, but I'm kind of be careful about adding new libraries, updating existing ones like pip, pip tools style, update them because is anybody watching? And if something bad got in there, would anybody know or are they all on break, right? Well, yeah. it turns out my paranoid side was on to something. Luckily, not anything I was using. But PyTorch discloses malicious dependency chain compromise over the holidays. Mm. This is mm. bad. Uh, if you pip installed somehow the PyTorch stuff, I don't know the exact how it links together, but it says PyTorch has identified a malicious dependency with the same name as the fr uh, framework's torch triton library so that was like somehow shipped or or directly linked in pytorch in a way that i don't fully understand because i don't use it but what happened is on merry merry christmas <laughs> the um on december 25th users who installed pytorch nightly uh, should ensure their systems are not compromised because of this triton torch what they did is somebody put a malicious version on PyPI and when PyTorch was getting set up, instead of picking its own version, it preferred the PyPI version, which was a virus. Hmm. Uh, so anyway, people can check that out. It's sub-ideal. Since the PyPI index takes precedence, this malicious, malicious package was being installed instead of the version from the official repository. This enables somebody to register a package to do bad things. Anyway, people can read all about that, but uh, if you have PyTorch and you pip installed it over the point of break, read that. Yeah. Plus, you I know, kudos for them for coming up with a great domain name, bleepingcomputer.com. <laughs> yes, I know, Bleeping Computer. There's a lot of good articles on Bleeping Computer. It's in my RSS feed. <laughs> um, all right. So, well, that's all I got for extras. Uh, how about a joke? Yeah, it sounds great. So first of all, let me... I, I don't want to kill the punchline before we set the stage. Okay, so I pulled up just the picture. Can you tell people what this is on the screen, Brian? You remember these things? Well, <laughs> remember they're still there. Uh, it's the not back on my of my laptop. A... Not on oh, my Mac right. Mini. Okay, it's it's on the back of like a computer or something, a a desktop computer. Next to the power cord, there's a toggle switch with a on and off. It's on and off toggle switch for a right. It's like a, a physical power button directly on the power supply on a desktop computer right yep yeah and robert robert got it exactly right so here is the joke they finally made a switch to exit vim <laughs> <laughs> and they, they've highlighted that power physical power button on the back of the power supply <laughs> nice well, know, that... you're, a, you're a vim lover so uh, uh i won't i won't rub it in too much but that's a pretty effective way to exit vim yeah well, Vim runs in a window, so just close the window. Uh, you know, whatever. Um, the <laughs> the uh, what I, a funny thing about power switches. Uh, so I used to work with a lot of. So I work with, with embedded systems, and some of them run Windows embedded. And uh, embedded systems are supposed to be able to toggle the power off, just like from the power supply. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, and now normal windows, you're not supposed to do that because, you know, it, you, you want to let it shut down gracefully. And if the disc is moving at the time and there's even with windows embedded, there's a, some, some issues or any embedded operating system, there are a possibility you could do some damage to the disc. If you're at you, if you power off at exactly the right time, but there's supposed to be safeguards in place to, to take care of it. So I'm just in the habit of using these things all the time of like, toggle off and on um and if we get a like a new batch of people in that are mostly from devops or from non-embedded worlds they're like what are you doing um, you're gonna break it yeah you're gonna break it like no these are good <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's so. awesome yeah my little um circuit python thing it doesn't have a power switch you just disconnect it from power if you want yeah. it off that's, that's yeah how it works well, and, and one of the reasons uh, now I'm going in the weeds, but one of the reasons for the 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 need for the ability to just power off is because a lot of times instruments are in a huge rack, and you don't go through and power off each individual instrument. You just turn the rack off. Um, so, wow, interesting. Anyway. Cool. Well, it's good to be back in 2023. Yeah, 
it is good to be back so welcome back and uh um thanks everybody for tuning in yeah you bet bye all bye